Autumn officially arrives this Saturday, and so as we do at the beginning of every astronomical season, we welcome back our resident astronomer, Dr. Chris Palma from the Penn State Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. How was your summer, Chris? It was great. Um, my son is newly obsessed with roller coasters, so we made trips to Dorney and Knoebels, so that, oh was, that was fun. Yeah, I think I stopped going on roller coasters about 10 years ago, but good for you. <laughs> hey, so to start, I was hoping to get your take on two space-related mm -hmm. items that were all over the news last week. First, we actually saw a civilian take a spacewalk, yeah. which I guess is sort of the next step in the privatization of space. Yeah. What are your takeaways? Yeah. We've talked before that astronomy and human spaceflight are different, but we use the same launch vehicles, and everything that human spaceflight does to let us learn about space enables more astronomy, right? So this um, was supposed to be a first step towards getting humans on the moon, and if humans are on the moon, that means we can put telescopes on the moon. So I love all these advances in human spaceflight. Yeah, interesting. And, and you know, the second item was the Boeing Starliner mm -hmm. spacecraft came yeah. back to Earth without any astronauts yeah. on it. And that actually has a link to this show because that means that our friend, astronaut Zena Cardman, uh, has been bumped from the mm -hmm. next mission because there's no room on yeah. the ISS. Yeah. I mean, what other consequences are there to situations like that? Yeah, and, and I didn't say this in, in my last answer, but space is hard, space is dangerous. And, and I was really fortunate to talk to um, astronaut John Grunsfeld, who was a space shuttle astronaut who visited Penn State. And what he really emphasized to us is um, you lose bone density, you lose muscle mass, um, it raises your risk factors for cancer and glaucoma. So, um, you, you know, to me, astronauts have to be incredibly brave to, to be up there knowing that it can impact their health, and yet they do it anyway. And, you know, speaking of astronauts, mm -hmm. there's a astronomy and astrophysics yeah. major here at Penn State. We've never really talked about your department. Yeah. Like, what kinds of, tell, tell us a little bit about it and sure. what kind of careers your graduates follow. Yeah. Well, many of our students want to go into astrophysics research. They want to do the kinds of um, research we talk about, studying exoplanets, galaxies, black holes. Some people do come thinking that will help them get into the astronaut corps, and it can, but most astronauts actually come from an engineering background because they're often building um, uh, things to survive in space, or they might actually come from a life sciences background. How does the human body adapt to space? So that doesn't mean you can't be an astronomer and an astronaut, but our students really approach science with the idea of how do I explain where did the Earth come from? Where did stars come from? How did the universe form? And they go into research careers to keep pursuing those answers. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of research, we always like to talk a little bit about some of the work your department's mm -hmm. doing. Um, this is going to sound strange, but I love cucumbers, especially <laughs> in my salad. So when I saw that word appear in a story put out by the College of, the Everly College of Science here about planetary orbits, I couldn't resist. What do we need to know about that research? Yeah. Most um, orbits are close to circular, but what they found was a planet following a very cucumber-shaped orbit. And the great part about that is our new ideas for how planets form tell us that planets shouldn't just form automatically on those circular orbits. Their orbits will change with time, and so if we truly believe that, we have to find examples. And so that um, discovery was one of the first examples finding a planet on one of those very highly elliptical orbits um, that proves that we're on the right track with understanding how planets form. And another one of those exoplanet discoveries. Yeah. It's funny you should talk about the shape of the orbit because I, I have a question in my meteorology uh, introductory class where I show the students four pictures of mm -hmm. and ask them which one of these is closest to the Earth orbit. Yep. And it's a circle. Yeah. It, yeah. You can't really tell that the Earth's orbit is elliptical because it's so close to being a circle. Yes, absolutely. Um, it seems to me that our, as our ability to observe improves, astronomers keep finding stuff mm. that makes us question <laughs> some long-held <laughs> theories yeah. about how the universe works. And in the case of some research from your department, how planetary systems form. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So it's very much related to, to what we were just talking about. So we see our solar system the way it exists today. You have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. The, the planets are on very, very circular orbits. 
but we have models that tell us how we think they should form. And one of those models tells us that the bigger, more massive the star is, the more raw material it has for making planets. Well, until our friends found a planet too big for its star. So this planet appears to have more mass than, than you should expect. So where did it come from? And the answer is we don't quite know yet. So like a planet that almost technically shouldn't be there based on the current models. Yes. Interesting. So we always like to close. I know you're excited to talk about one of your favorite yeah. sky watching targets that's returning to the night yeah. sky. Yeah. So absolutely, um, the, the jewel of the sky for looking with a small telescope or with binoculars is the planet Saturn. And people often ask, is Saturn up, is Saturn up? And it hasn't been, but now it is. So with fall um, coming our way, right now, tonight, you can go outside and you'll see Saturn right at sunset, low in the southeastern sky. But as fall progresses, each night it'll start getting higher and higher. So further into the fall, it'll be higher in the southern sky. And as I always say, if you have a small pair of binoculars or a telescope, once you've spotted the planet, try to look at it because you'll be able to see the rings with even the smallest pair of binoculars. And it's very bright. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the brightest objects in the night sky. Yes. Dr. Chris Palma, Penn State Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, thanks very much. And we will be back in a moment with more.